Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So, over the last couple of weeks I've been doing videos about the Marvels, and about Bob Iger, and about Disney and Marvel, and I fully intended to do something different this week, but they just keep popping up in the news, especially the entertainment news. And it seems, quite honestly, that the Marvels is the straw that has now broke the camel's back. And there have been some newer statements and developments coming out of Disney and Marvel that seem to give people a little bit of hope that we're going to see a return to normalcy, or at the very least a beginning of a return to normalcy sometime within the foreseeable future. But I want to look at those statements and then put the statement of Elon Musk right next to that, and his statement over the last week has been F you, Bob Iger. And when you put those two kinds of statements right next to each other, you'll see that although there might be a change coming within entertainment, make no mistake about it, it's a change of tactics, not a change of heart. But if you are looking for some good, sane, heroic-based entertainment, there are two links in the description and the pinned comment for my three graphic novels. Two of them are superhero graphic novels following heroes that are trying to be traditionally heroic and virtuous in a world that's anything but. They are Thomas Valiant and the Valiant Heroes. And there is also a link for my sword and sorcery low fantasy graphic novel that is in the vein of Conan, Cull, and Solomon Cain, where an aging king must fight for his life on the battlefield in order to regain his honor. And you're looking at some of the spectacular art from those books in the background, so if any of that looks or sounds appealing to you at all, click on one of those links in the description and go on over and see if my graphic novels are for you. So, back to the topic. And before I get to the statements of Elon Musk about what he said to Bob Iger, basically F you Bob Iger, I want to look at similar kinds of statements just for a moment from the mainstream entertainment industry, focusing again, usually as I do, upon Marvel and Disney because I get a lot of my information through the comic industry, and those are the big boys on the block first for comics and then for entertainment. But since I've been doing these videos analyzing those industries for the last, oh, six years now, people like myself have seen over and over again statements from not only the companies like Disney, like Marvel, but also the creatives, especially the creatives who work for companies like Marvel, comic book writers and the like, showrunners, people who write for television and movies, basically saying the exact same thing to their audience. Screw you, we have a giant pot of money, we're going to do what we want to do, not what you're saying you want. This is epitomized by the statement of Kelly Sue DeConnick, Kelly Sue DeConnick being the person who revamped Captain Marvel, the one that you see on the movie screen right now. She said, if you don't like my politics, don't buy my books. And then people didn't buy her books, and she had to come back several years later trying to make excuses for why the comic industry is failing. And the thing is that this is genuinely the attitude of the people, I would say, right down to the creatives, all the way up to the boardroom, all the way up to Bob Iger. It's, we have this giant pot of Disney money, screw you, we're going to do what we want. This can be seen by some court documents that were submitted by the Disney company over, I think, the last week. These court documents are meant as a insurance policy, really. I won't get into the whole thing about the filings and what they're for, but they appear that they have been submitted to the courts because the company is trying to insulate itself against its shareholders coming after them for basically mismanaging the company. And although there are thousands of pages, I do believe, in these documents, the one very interesting thing that I had heard that was pulled out from it is the fact that Disney recognizes that it was in misalignment with the public in its storytelling. And this again would be one of those statements I mentioned earlier that people are looking at and saying, maybe they're having a change of heart. No, no, they're actually trying to use these court statements to defend themselves to ensure that they can continue on with what they're doing. They're saying, yes, we were in misalignment with what the audience is wanted, but we were actually doing the right thing for the company. That's what the documents are for, saying, yes, we were doing the right thing for the company. That's the claim of the documents themselves. So again, it's the attitude of, we have this giant pot of money, and them saying to the audience, screw you, we don't need you, we're going to do what we want to do because this is where we think not only the company, but entertainment itself is going in the future. But here's the thing, that giant pot of money is now starting to dry up. We have had three strikes for Disney in their attempt to 
generate this kind of quote-unquote entertainment that is telling the audience what they want instead of giving the audience what they want. Reminds me of that statement I always go back to from the vice president of content and character development of Marvel Comics about eight years ago, stating quite emphatically that the audience might think they want the old kinds of stories, but they really don't. Because here's the thing, the movies are the giant moneymaker for Disney and really the cash cow for much of the entertainment industry itself. And that video I did about an old Bob Iger interview from five years ago, that video I did two weeks ago, which I'll link that in the description and at the end of this if you want to go listen to it. I was comparing Bob Iger's statements from five years ago where he thought the company was going towards and where he was directing it towards and comparing that with today and seeing how that has failed. But the point is, within that interview, what he was focusing on as the future of Disney was the acquisition of Pixar, Star Wars, and Marvel. And it was his intent for Disney to use these intellectual properties to leverage, as he says, these intellectual properties along with the brand recognition of Disney and those other companies in order to sell Disney products. And quite honestly, even if one of those franchises were still in good standing, they would probably still have this giant pot of money. Well, I'm sure they still do, but it doesn't look like that to the investors right now, since Disney stocks have been the lowest they have been in at least five years. But the problem is, they've been failing one after another after another. Pixar has soured the milk for Pixar movies and really computer generated kinds of movies, which is what Iger talks about. He wasn't buying Pixar for Pixar. He was buying it for the technology of actually making animated computer generated movies. But that got soured with the new Buzz Lightyear movie and its political and social agenda. And we can now see the fallout of that with the new movie that has just come out from Disney, which is Wish, and no one likes it. No one's going to go see it. So again, that's strike one with Pixar. That brand has been tarnished. That ability to leverage intellectual property through that brand has also been tarnished. So strike one. The exact same thing has happened to Star Wars years ago now with The Force Awakens. It just soured the milk of the Star Wars brand for so many Star Wars fans and continued to pump out Star Wars product after Star Wars product thinking that they could just get over that hump. And all it did was make things worse by cementing this sour taste within the mouths of those people who actually want to see Star Wars products. So again, that brand has been tarnished and the ability of it to leverage intellectual property has been tarnished along with it. So strike two. And now with the Marvels coming out, we can positively say that the same thing has been happening with Marvel and its push for phase four and its push of Captain Marvel as the new figurehead for the entire MCU. When the first Captain Marvel movie came out and it did so well, quote unquote, the company was saying, look how good it did. People actually want this product. And the naysayers were saying, no, you just sandwiched it in between two things that people wanted to see, made them think that they had to go see it. And so everybody went to go see this. No one liked it. No one wanted to see it. No one wants this direction. But again, they downplayed that as just the haters and the negative people, and they don't know what they're talking about. But with the Marvels coming out and it having a spectacularly poor showing, both within the first weekend and the second week, having historic falls, yes, we can now point to this point within the MCU of the Captain Marvel movie saying, you started to sour the milk there and people just don't want it anymore. So again, that brand recognition has been tarnished. And so along with it has their ability to leverage the intellectual property of Marvel. So strike three. Plus, on top of all of that, you had the controversy of Snow White even before the Marvels came out, which again is Disney's product itself, not from these smaller companies that they gobbled up, but a Disney product trying to focus on the nostalgia of people for Snow White, but to bring it into this new politically charged message driven medium that they have within the entertainment system right now and people just making fun of it on several different levels showing Disney that no one wants this kind of entertainment from Disney. You add that to the pile and you have a view of the failure of all the giant money makers for the Walt Disney Company itself, which is their movie products. And as I indicated, along with it, the failure of the brand and its ability to 
as Iger wanted to do, leverage intellectual property. And I went over all of that because I want to look now at a few statements coming out from Marvel and Disney that again, some people are taking as a positive statement, saying perhaps they will turn around. First, we have some statements from creatives, which again, I go back to the comic industry, and these aren't new statements, although some of them are new because they've been continuous for the last, I think, six months now. But you have the people in the comic industry who are writers and creators, and yes, they do overlap somewhat with the production of, at the very least, the television shows for superhero-based entertainment. But you have the people who were just diversity hires and they're being as absurd as they always were. They're trying to play off of their identity politics in order to try and gain back some of their prestige in some way. But you have a lot of these other kinds of writers and creators, people like Kelly Sudakonic or Kelly Thompson or Gail Simone, names which you might recognize if you follow comics, basically retreating to a position of gaslighting, saying, well, you know, we never wanted to do that to begin with. We told the people at the company that we shouldn't be doing that, changing around the characters, changing their race or their gender or their sexuality. We didn't want to go in that direction, but this is what we were told to do. We were on the side of the fans the entire time. And again, for the last at least six months, this has been the tactic of the people trying to keep their jobs because some of these people do have some actual merit. They can write something that looks like a decent story if given the right motivation, which they haven't for years. So they're trying to cover their butts by pointing the finger at other people saying, we were just following order. And over the last week, possibly two weeks, you had a statement very similar to these kinds of statements from the woman the young woman playing Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, in the Marvels. I think her name is Aman Valani. Now, to this young woman's credit, most people are saying that she's the only thing that has any kind of personality within the entire Marvel movies, although that personality doesn't substitute for character development. But anyway, Miss Valani seemed to be, and I stress that, seemed to be throwing a little bit of shade towards Bob Iger and towards the rest of the Disney company, saying, we did the best with what we had. And if the movie is failing, it's not the fault of, well, her and the creative people like her that were producing the movie. It was the company itself and their direction that they were following. Again, just following orders. But then you have a statement from Bob Iger himself. And Bob Iger was doing the exact same thing, just in the reverse. He's saying that the storytellers for Disney seem to have lost their way in telling good stories. And that he's using as an excuse for why his product or the products of Disney in general are doing poorly. And each of these statements or groups of statements coming out from Disney and Marvel, while if you look at them independently, one on one, just what they say in a very strict manner within the context that they're giving, which is their interview, some people are looking at it and saying, well, it seems like they're having a change of heart. It seems like these people are recognizing that something is wrong with what they're doing within the storytelling, that the audience doesn't want it. And from that, they're inferring that, well, this gives us hope that they're going to turn around and start producing entertainment based on merit again. But here's where the statements of Elon Musk come into play to show that, no, even though they might make better entertainment, that's not much of a hard thing to do from the base level of entertainment that they're producing right now, even though they might start making better entertainment, doesn't mean they're going to start making good entertainment. Which again is just another way of saying, as I said before, just because they have a change of direction doesn't mean they've had a change of heart. But before I get into the statement of Elon Musk and what it means for entertainment, we have to look at Musk himself and where this statement is coming from and what kind of operator he is within this system. Because really, what he is, is a wild card. And here's the thing about this politically charged entertainment of this quote-unquote progressive ideological bent that has been capturing almost all forms of entertainment for the last 10 years minimum. The thing is that, what do they always talk about? What does it always come back to? Well, it always comes back to statements about systemic oppression of one kind or another, or institutional this or that. Now, why do they always come back to this? Why? Well, because that's where their thinking comes from. 
That's the basis of how they operate, and they're assuming their operational practices are the way that everything works. Which is to say, what they want is operational control. What they want is systemic and institutional control. Because they believe that since all the evils are coming from these places, if they then control these places, again, which are systems and operating mechanisms, and institutions, if they control them in the quote-unquote right way, they will get rid of all these bad things. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking for operational control of these large mechanisms. And here's the thing about that kind of mentality and that kind of operation. It cannot deal with a wild card. And the thing is that society has slowly started to recognize this fact. They don't like the direction that their culture or their government or their society is going in, and they realize that the only way to get out of what we have around us today is to back a wild card. This is why we have political operators like Donald Trump or others like him throughout the world. People like, I don't know, Gert Velders, I think he's in the Netherlands, and that actor, I don't even know his name off the top of my head, who just won an election in South America. These are wild cards, because people are recognizing that's the only way out. And this is especially true for the entertainment industry, and especially true for that type of company that Bob Iger wanted to build. Why? Because again, he stated five years ago, what was the direction he was bringing the entire company in? Well, he wanted to depend upon brand recognition so that the audience would choose Disney because they recognize the brand, and then after that, leverage existing intellectual property in order to tell the stories that they were going to sell as entertainment. Now, you'll notice in that entire thing, it depends on what? It depends on the fact that there's nothing new there. Nothing. Brand recognition is depending on nostalgia and your memories of things past. The leveraging of intellectual property is existing intellectual property. There's nothing new there. It all comes from the past. And Iger was saying within that interview, the newness that he said was going to come out of this entire thing was the way the stories were told according to, and he states this directly more than once, according to diversity and inclusion. That was his newness. That was the grab of the new for the audience. But the audience has just shown him again and again that they don't want that. That isn't something new, let alone something entertaining. But more to the point of this entire thing, if you look specifically at movies and these giant franchises that we have right now of different kinds that keep on being rehashed over and over again, you will notice that many, many of them began as a wild card. Many of them were just a small budget movie that were made by someone who decided to try something new and it just caught on like wildfire. Just off the top of my head, thinking about science fiction and fantasy. Look at Star Wars. Look at the Terminator franchise or the Aliens franchise. Look at so many of these originally low budget movies that just took off and now we have almost empires built upon them. All of this was because Someone decided to be a wild card. Someone decided to do something new. Someone decided to go in a direction that no one else had gone in. And that is really what Bob Iger and the rest of the people in Hollywood are afraid of. That's why they need institutional control. Because they cannot milk the cash cow of brand recognition and existing intellectual property if new things are getting out there to the public which can catch on like wildfire. And quite honestly, just to throw this in here, besides the fact of the political and the entertainment system, just look at what is happening within the Near East right now with the conflict going on. That came out of nowhere. That was a wild card that people in the quote-unquote progressive political circles didn't expect. And it is throwing deep wrenches in their entire plans, besides taking the mask off of some people, especially their supporters, and how they think and what they think. Again, this is something that came out of the blue. It was a wild card, and they can't deal with it. And this is what Elon Musk is. Because without rehashing the entire Elon Musk interview that he did, the most important statement was him saying to the advertisers who were trying to, in his words, blackmail his company by controlling what could be shown on his platform. Again, systemic control is what they were looking for. He says, I have my own giant pot of money, screw you. 
And he called out one person in particular, saying, F you, to Bob Iger. And this statement, this simple statement by Musk, shows that no, the entertainment industry, although, again, they might have a change within the near future in what they make, they have not, and have no intention of having a change of heart. Because, yes, I know, Disney is a giant corporation, they can't turn around on a dime, but Bob Iger is an individual. He's someone who controls the entire company. He can make changes, which are on a dime, and he simply chooses not to do so. Because, make no mistake about it, Twitter has driven this crazy train for the last almost decade now of systemic political slash entertainment control over what you can hear and see. And Disney was using Twitter for these exact reasons in various ways. I covered a couple of years ago interviews that were being done on Marvel.com with Marvel employees who were hired on as data analysts. And where were they analyzing the data from? They were analyzing the data from Twitter. This was their stated job. And they didn't state any other even social media platforms that they were focusing on. They were focusing on analyzing data specifically, and it seemed, from their statements, exclusively from Twitter. So again, you have Marvel employees, which are Disney employees, employing this platform as part of the mechanism of their entertainment industry. And if Twitter is that important, and they have been using it as an important tool for the last little while, would you not think that if there was a large exodus of advertisers from this platform, and you are one of the larger advertisers, wouldn't you say, if I stick with this platform, hey, I'm going to have more than my fair share of positive feedback from these advertisements because with all the rest of the big players gone, my company can leverage that platform and those advertisements to a much more effective degree. That would be the sane interpretation of how to deal with this situation if you are looking to actually A, make a change, and B, start making money again. But quite the opposite is happening. Disney, run by Bob Iger, is taking the advice of the ADL, which is a far-left, quote-unquote, progressive political actor, saying you can't advertise on this platform anymore. We must organize a complete abandonment of advertisers from this platform so that, what? So that in order to get these advertisers back, the platform needs to be under our control. Needs to show only the things we want them to show, which is exactly what Elon Musk was talking about. If you're going to use your advertising dollars to try to blackmail me and control my platform, then leave. And again, he's calling out Bob Iger very specifically. So with all of that being said, and with taking those kinds of statements and putting them next to each other, we can see that, yes, there's a lot of finger pointing going on in the entertainment industry saying, well, it's their problem. They're the ones who did something wrong. It wasn't me. Everybody trying to cover their own hide. Everyone saying, yes, there's something wrong, but it's not my fault. But don't take those statements of, yes, there is something wrong with being an admission that they're going to change. And I just want to end on one point. The point of why am I concentrating on this? I have a channel which focuses on storytelling. I have a channel which focuses on the true nature of a hero. Why am I focusing on this kind of entertainment political back and forth? Well, because as far as I can see in the future, what is going to happen is, number one, you're going to see a, as I have predicted for years now, return to nostalgia. Again, not giving you anything new, but really cutting out the race and gender swapping and all that and just giving you the same story over and over again to try to regain the trust of the people who are the audience. But at the same time, you're going to get excuses of the fact that, well, the economy isn't really doing well. That's why entertainment isn't doing well. But that is a false premise and a false statement to make. And some people have already started making that assertion. But the thing is that if you know anything about the history of North American entertainment, you will know that storytelling and entertainment are what is desperately needed when times are bad. People will actually spend much more money on entertainment when things are tough because they need escapism and they need escapism that is positive in order to give them something to escape to. This is where Hollywood that exists right now came from. It is still, even today, working off of the fumes of the golden age of Hollywood. And the golden age of Hollywood 
came out of the ramped up systems of entertainment and storytelling and movie making that started within the depression because people needed entertainment. They needed escapism. They needed some positive reinforcement that everything was going to be okay. And this is also where the golden age of superheroes comes from. Those heroes in their various forms, super and not, were presented to a society who was desperately looking for something to cling to. Some heroic ideals that they could see and point to and realize that yes, something noble can come out of this entire thing. And funny enough, on my Wednesday live streams, which I do talking more about comic creation and development, you have Will Eisner stating in an interview that I talked about, making the claim that, you see, what these great stories were doing, and he was telling these great stories back in the 30s, he says, they're great because they give society something that they're lacking. Something that society desperately needs. And to some extent, that need filling gives them hope. And this is what heroes do. This is what heroic stories do. This is what the true idea of heroism, which is virtue, does for people. But it's all predicated upon ideas of positivity, ideas of virtue, hard work, creativity, individual achievement. And that positivity is absolutely lacking from anything coming out of the mainstream entertainment industry right now. And that's what I mean by saying that the entertainment industry does not and will not in the near future have a change of heart. There is no change towards this positive way of telling stories. There's simply an acknowledgement that they have to retreat to new and even more intrusive systems of control. So if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right hand corner of your screen to subscribe. That really helps my channel, by the way. And don't forget, there are two links in the description for my three graphic novels, stories that concentrate on the old traditional good way of storytelling and old traditional heroes, excitement, action, and fun. And if any of that sounds appealing to you at all, click on one of those links in the description and go on over and order yourself a copy of one of my graphic novels today. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.